Hi, I'm Ken Crawford, president of the Alaska Conference, and I want to show you around my Alaska. I love it here. This is not the end of the world, but it's pretty close. I love Alaska. It's the greatest adventure you could ever imagine. If you want to find out more, go to our website, alaskaconference.org, and you'll find all kinds of information and stories on what Alaska is like. There's a constant collision between civilization and nature because we live next to each other. There's a feeling of remoteness. Not isolation, but remoteness. There is a vastness in the wilderness in Alaska. The mountains are more majestic. Nature is undisputed master. There's something about this country that sets off in me a craving for heaven. The living conditions are a challenge, I can tell you. But the needs in Alaska far outweigh the challenges of living here. Kodiak Island is an Alaskan icon. Its 3,500 square miles of pristine wilderness is a coveted destination by outdoor enthusiasts from around the globe. Like the many other remote towns and boroughs along Alaska's 54,000 miles of shoreline, the residents of the small town of Kodiak thrive, despite being cut off from the Alaskan mainland. Gore Cox is a hydraulic technician and mechanic who calls Kodiak home. My work here involves the repair and fabrication of components and equipment used on fishing boats for the most part. Because we're on an island and because the time frame sometimes is so short because people's living is dependent on their equipment and this is typical of Alaska. It takes so long to get stuff here you just can't go down to a hardware store or something and buy what you need or a parts store. You have to be able to manufacture that part. Okay, okay. Thanks so much. All right, you betcha. Yeah. Good luck with the oil. Yeah. The fact that, that we have this huge industry and this fishing fleet, what that's done is that's brought the Coast Guard here. So we have one of the largest Coast Guard bases in the United States. And their primary concern is to protect the waters and also to protect the fishing fleet. So we end up with a substantial influence from the Coast Guard here and uh, they add a lot to the community. Since I moved here to Kodiak, I've come to realize the differences, especially living on an island. The only way you can get here is either fly or take a boat. You can't just drive off somewhere, you know, so you're kind of trapped in a way. But uh, I like that. And you're living in a small area surrounded by the wilderness, which is called the ocean, and then also the vastness of the island itself. Um, we do have uh, the possibility of tsunamis. In 1964, the Good Friday earthquake rocked Alaska, creating a 30 to 50 foot high tsunami. The town of Kodiak was alerted by radio of the impending disaster, and most residents made it safely to higher ground. However, 15 fishermen lost their lives as they rushed to the harbor to save their boats, and most of the waterfront industries were destroyed. I own a 40 foot X charter vessel. I spent a few years uh, building up to that vessel. And my original purpose was to uh, go into uh, charter fishing, taking people sport fishing for hire. And during the course of that endeavor, I inadvertently ended up helping some of the local community, the local churches uh, with transportation and whatnot to their Bible camps and whatnot. And I really enjoyed doing that and uh, eventually got away from the idea of being a charter skipper and decided that uh, a community service ministry would be uh, something that I really would like to do. So with that in mind, I proceeded to reconstruct, rebuild, and build this boat up for the sole purpose of being a community service. And that's really the love of my life right now. I came to Kodiak because I love the marine environment. I like the fact that I'm surrounded by salt water. Um, 
but just the raw beauty here on the island is, is quite incredible. Uh, during the summer, it's just brilliant green. They even call this place the Emerald Island. So I think probably the nature itself is the most attractive thing about Kodiak. That uh, so much of it is not is under undeveloped. We have little cities and little villages, and the rest of Kodiak is wilderness. Kodiak's home to the largest mammal in the world, which would be the Kodiak brown bear. Um, there is no other bear larger than that in the world. So it's wild, you know. Bears and eagles and otters in the ocean and and puffins and all this wonderful nature all around us and, and I think that's probably what brings anybody here is that attraction to nature, to, to the wildness. The peace of mind, away from society, uh, just being out uh, on the water, um, teaching people. Your front door is a million dollar view every day you wake up. The fishing industry makes up about 50% of Alaska's export commodities. Kodiak, Alaska is currently the third most productive fishing port in the United States and it's also one of the most productive fishing ports in the world. The port harbors a fleet of more than 700 fishing vessels. Connor Ross, a lifetime fisherman, has made his life here. I am the captain of the Flying Ocean, and it's a 100-foot crab boat, uh, tender, and it does mainly per, uh, Pacific cod, commercial cod fishing. And uh, it tenders salmon from Chignik, Bristol Bay, Prince William Sound, and Cook Inlet. Yeah, what are you working on, Geasley? Uh, I got it drilled it all the way down, the bracket. Okay. And uh, it's going gonna, gonna, gonna to be nice. This boat right now, we're getting a, a structural replacement in our bow. And uh, just overall a facelift. You know, we're going through all the engines. We're going through the electrical. Uh, we're going through... Uh, the fish hole, the, the propulsion of the boat, which is the shaft, uh, the underbody. We go through all the Coast Guard safety inspections, just make sure that everything's top notch, that we don't have any problems in any of our seasons. Most of the fishing fleet is in the harbor preparing for the salmon run in June. Boats are equipped with cooling systems that keep their catch in a salty brine just below freezing to preserve the fish until they get back to port. Down in the hull of the Lady Lou, Fred Steger makes last minute changes to the refrigeration system. Springtime means the guys that are fishing, the smaller boats are fishing herring, but we're, we're working on the boat. We got a new, new boat and we're putting refrigeration in, which has turned into a, a vast project, but uh, we're making headway and getting ready for salmon. The, the process of fish to table begins really with, with what we're doing right now, which is getting the boat ready. You have to get your gear ready, you have to assemble your crew, or you have to find a crew if you don't have a, uh, a, a standard set crew. Then you go out and, and uh, start fishing. You catch the fish, you bring them to town often, sometimes uh, in the case of salmon and crab, they, the canneries will actually send tenders or large vessels out to the, the grounds. The processors process the fish in whatever manner they think they'll sell best, and then they, they ship it out to the markets uh, around the world and in the U.S. ISA is one of five fish processing plants in town. With 300 workers, they can process over 500,000 pounds of fish in a 24-hour period. Got lots of risks in fishing. There's injury, uh, capsize, um, man overboard, uh, just uh, weather. Uh, there's everything. Just walking down the stairs or being on the back deck of a fishing vessel. 
Uh, you got the crane, the block, hydraulic crab block. You have picking hooks. You have crab pots. You have uh, just all the equipment on the boat is a hazard for anybody, you know, that's operating. There's everything that's a hazard on a crab boat or a tender or any boat. All right. When you're done with that, peel the tape off and then come see me. It's bred into me. I've been doing it since I was a kid as well. And it's, I've tried to quit more than once. And it's something that I just come back to. It's, it's in your blood. I like everything about it. There's nothing I don't like about fishing. Alaska is the land of the individualist, but it's also the land of those who are highly educated and highly artistic. Did you know that the state of Alaska has the highest level of education per capita in all of the United States? Also happens to have the highest number of millionaires per capita. But there are some unique, talented individuals in Alaska. I want you to meet Paul Kildall is a concert pianist who lives in a log cabin in the interior of Alaska. Burr. <laughs> this way to the piano room. Wait till you see his studio. Paul Kildall, I'm here at Medelton Creek here, Alaska, and uh, we're about 156 miles east of Anchorage on the Glen Highway. We went snow machining this last Sunday to an ice cave at Sena, which is just out of Valdez. It was massive. It was just ice. Over, you could have fit 100 snow machines in it. It was absolutely fantastic. Everything is gorgeous. I work here at the Prince William Sound Community College in Glen Allen, Alaska. I was raised in a Catholic home, and it was a, an abusive alcoholic home, so I, of course, was kind of that way also. I, um, I, I was an alcoholic by the age of 18. I moved to Anchorage, joined a Pentecostal church, and um, decided that I didn't want to live in Anchorage, so moved back to Glen Allen. Starting my story here, I guess, uh, came up in Alaska in 1974 uh, from California. Uh, little town called Oakdale by Modesto and uh, always wanted to come up to the far north because we had a sixth grade teacher in our uh, uh, our elementary school system Mrs. Anderson that kept reading all these north far north stories all the time and I, I just wanted to come to the far north and that's one of the reasons uh, probably the biggest reason I spent and came up here uh, prior to that uh, when I got out of high school uh, I, I was raised an Adventist, and uh, in 67 I went to uh, Vienna to study, and um, kind of lost my way with my uh, Adventist uh, heritage and bringing it up, and uh, I just kept getting further and further away from the Lord. Um, uh, while I was uh, over in Vienna there, we studied, and I got a lot of my training, I just, I love the training there. And it just tells me exactly how to teach kids. I've never, uh, uh, it's one of the greatest schoolings I've ever had, even though I did not stay that long there. I decided that uh, this is way too narrow of a field. Um, I still have a lot of country boy in me. I like cars, tractors, motorcycles, and stuff like that. And it was just too narrow of a field for me uh, to be going into this uh, type of work of playing concert pianist type thing. And uh, so I, uh, left out of there and um, came back to the States and then I got a ride from uh, uh, a friend that uh, wanted me to uh, share the expenses to come to Alaska and that's how we got to Alaska and um, uh, we came up here I uh, told my mother and my dad and they weren't very pleased with me it was a Friday evening and I threw all my clothes in the garbage bags, black garbage bags. We threw them back to pick up and on our way we went to Alaska. So uh, that's how I ended up here in 74. 
uh, at all this time in between, I was racing motorcycles and had a motorcycle shop and that kind of stuff, and I had not touched the piano at all. In 77, uh, it was a Yamaha dealership there, and I bought a new C3 six-foot Yamaha Grand. And I thought, well, I need to get back into this. So uh, away we went with that and brought it out here, and uh, um, we um, started teaching music because people found out that I played and um, I was teaching quite a few students, up to 35 kids. And uh, uh, I was still driving truck at the same time. I decided, well, I'm gonna have to pick one of the two, drive truck or teach kids, one, one of the two. So uh, I quit the truck driving business and taught full time uh, out of our home in Glen Allen there. And we had 35 kids and uh, had a good time doing that. But there's uh, the reality of medical and all these different things that I didn't have. And they uh, kept calling me to come make loads for them or drive to Anchorage or drive to Fairbanks or wherever. So I kind of conceded to do that. And uh, we, uh, we stopped teaching piano. In the meantime, uh, my C3, I beat it to death. Uh, as you know, when you tune pianos and you play them a lot, well, maybe you don't know, I should, shouldn't say that, but when you keep pulling on strings and pulling on strings, they get brittle and then they break. And I was having a lot of problems with it. Went back into Anchorage and this nine foot Baldwin was sitting there and they brought it for Dave Brubeck and his quartet. And uh, they didn't want to ship it back to uh, a lower 48. So we bought this piano here and it's been a wonderful, the Baldwin SD10 is a wonderful piano. So that's, uh, that's where we're at, I guess, on the, on the piano thing. I got a couple of kids right now that I'm teaching right now, but not full time. Very difficult thing for me to come back to the church. Uh, I was brought up in a very legalistic family, very legalistic. And uh, I didn't really want anything to do with the church. I might also say that uh, who is my wife now and I were pretty much on the road to alcoholism. I met my husband, Paul. He was a truck driver here at one of the local fuel companies. And he um, had been raised in a Ad Seventh-day Adventist home. But he had gone out of the, of the church. He was drinking and carousing. And we got together. And Paul's mother sent us some cassette tapes by a Seventh-day Adventist evangelist, Morris Venden. Many of you might have heard of him. One day she was. Uh, uh, we weren't married yet, we were living together, and uh, she says, we need to go to church. And I, I cringed at that, I didn't want to have anything to do with church. So uh, I says, well, if you're going to go to church, you're going to go to a Seventh-day Adventist church on, on the Sabbath. And she says, what's that? And uh, she says, well, you're going to have to show me out of the Bible where that says that and everything. So we started studying, and then my son Terry, uh, was her son, not my son at the time. I mean, I had not adopted him, but he started reading the Bible and says, Dad, we got to go to church. He says, this is not right. And it's Sunday, going to Sunday and all these different doctrines that were coming out. And he says, why aren't you doing this? And of course, all I could think about was uh, the, uh, the way it was before the Adventist church, legalism. And I didn't want any part of that. In the meantime, of course, we were studying, and Gail was studying, and she made up her mind she's going to become an Adventist, I think, at that time, and Terry. And um, we, um, I was rebelling against that quite a bit. I did, I did not like it, because I didn't want to get back into this uh, Adventism, legalistic. And at the same time, my mother kept sending me tapes of Morris Venden, and I kept shoving them off, and shoving them off, and shoving them off. So. Uh, he did a series down in Southern Missionary. That's, I'm not sure they changed the name, but that's what it was at the time. Righteousness by Christ. And um, I listened to the tapes. I never have looked back. Uh, it made me understand what the relationship with Christ is. It made me understand uh, um, probably John 15 is probably one of the principal texts that I use. You know, he's the vine, I'm the branch. And can't do anything without him. And I thought it was always about the rules, but it isn't, it's about the relationship. God had a plan for our lives and he wanted us to love him, and we do. Oh, Lord, will we ever. But 
we, um, we have raised a family here in Glen Allen. We have um, three children, three both children. We have another child we adopted when she was a senior in high school who came from a very abusive home. And because of my background, I was able to connect with her. She has since become a very, very lovely, God-fearing woman. She has just got a wonderful love for God. She's put on seminars about suicide prevention and about how God can bring you from, from the depths of despair, if you will, to heights of wonder, actually. It's wonderful being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and knowing that God cares about every facet of my life. My biggest hope and wish and, and what I'm looking forward to most of all is when I see him coming in the clouds of glory to take us home. My accent, which you are probably hearing here, is truly Alaskan since I've been here all of my life. And everybody says, where are you from? What kind of an accent is that? It's Alaskan and I'm, I'm glad to be an Alaskan and I'm glad to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. We started going to church in Valdez and it's approximately 135 miles. Uh, one way from where we lived up on the Gulf Canada River. The next step was getting baptized. And we were baptized, I believe, in 84, a camp meeting. They made a wooden box and lined it, and Steve Beerman baptized us. So that's where we're at right now, and uh, we've had several places we've tried to get churches going here, and uh, sometimes they go for a couple of years, you know, meeting at homes and stuff, and uh, um, then it would die out. So. It's, uh, it's been kind of a tough hole, tough road to uh, hoe here in Glen Allen there. But I sure believe that the Lord has something here soon because I've, I think what we see in the economy and what's going on in the world that uh, people are not getting the right answers in these other churches. And I think we have a very unique message. The Valdez Church is our principal. It's our home church that I identify with. And uh, we had a lot of, lot of good times there. It was a good church. We uh, lived in a uh, very large house in uh, Glen Allen there and had five bedrooms and a big garage. And uh, we sold it because it was just too big for two of us, we thought. And uh, we moved out here, but there was no room. Uh, we live in a little log house right next door to us here. And I bought this building and we moved it out here because it's well insulated and it's, I can keep it at the humidity I want and the temperature I want for this grand. So, um, we're looking at a new house right now in Glen Allen, and I can hardly wait. Maybe we'll get it. It's a big house. We can have church there and put this, uh, this piano in there and so more people can enjoy it. So, uh, Anyway, uh, yeah, I, uh, I do a lot of reloading. Uh, this is a Dillon Press 550 Press, and uh, it's a progressive press that I use. Uh, I can load about 150 rounds an hour with it, and um, I do a lot of shooting. So, you know, out in the remote area here, we don't have access to um, ammunition. And uh, even in Anchorage, it's hard to get the stuff now, the components with all this uh, gun laws that are going into effect. So we make our own, we put our own stuff together here out in the remote area. We uh, do the rifles and we do the, the this here's a 10 millimeter um, pistol shell for a Glock 20 that I, uh, I shoot, and these are kind of hard to get a hold of these 10 millimeters because a lot of people don't shoot the 10 millimeter. As it is out here in the, uh, in the bush here, it's the same way, there's no churches out here to speak of. Uh, there's little ones, uh, groups here and there that uh, we get together with. Um, we have one main building that we are using in Glen Allen that we use for church once a month is what we're doing. The one thing that I'm really excited about out here in the bush is uh, the remote Sabbath school lesson that uh, anybody can call in on an 800 number. It's free. We just love to have you study with us on the Sabbath school lessons. The same lesson that they have in the church on that same Sabbath. And uh, we just love to talk to people about our Lord and Jesus Christ. Our time at the, we start is 10 o'clock Alaska time. And uh, we'd love to have you join us there on the phone. Like I said, it's a free number. Well, I want to thank you. Uh, for visiting here with me and uh, hope you'll join us in our Sabbath school, Bush Sabbath school lesson here. Uh, I will play you now uh, one of my favorite pieces here, uh, Jesus, Jesus, or something about that name by Bill Gaither.
For my Alaska, this has been Ken Crawford. Thanks so much for coming with me. If you enjoyed watching this series, if you're interested in what you've seen or what we're doing in Alaska, go to the Alaska website, alaskaconference.org, and there you'll find additional information.